So I'm going to do 50 years of computer architecture in about 15 minutes. <laughs> uh, all right, so we're going to go back uh, before all of you were born uh, to the 1960s. And uh, IBM had this problem. IBM had four different lines of computers and all had their own different instruction sets. Um, not only the, and here's pictures of them, and uh, for people who've been in the industry for a very long time, they, they remember some of these numbers. Uh, each system had its own instruction set, it had its own I.O. system, it had its own uh, storage system, different assemblers, compilers, and libraries, and not only that, each one of these had a different marketplace, scientific computing, or business data processing, or real time. So, that's how IBM uh, uh, ran its business. It had uh, four independent businesses. So they came up with this idea in around 1960 that they didn't have to do that. They didn't have to have different instruction sets for different marketplaces. They had this radical notion that they could have a single instruction set that could do everything, all the way from the smallest business computers to the largest scientific computers. So this was a bold vision, no one had ever thought you could do that at that time. Uh, and so they announced a brand new idea of a family of computers. That is what we would call today binary compatibility. You could write a program for the smallest computer that IBM made and it would work with exactly correctly on the biggest computer that they made. Uh, and so it was the first time that you could have portable programs between different sizes and types of computers. And as you can see this example, uh, back then, you know, storage was a lot smaller. Uh, the small one had 64 kilobytes, not megabytes or not gigabytes, but kilobytes. And the big one had 512 kilobytes, you know, generous uh, one. Uh, the data path widths were to be as little as 8 bits to as wide as 64 bits. And then the technology they were building you know, had a you know, 33 megahertz clock rate or the really fast one, 200 megahertz clock rate. And uh, they, uh, the simplest one didn't even have its own registers. You actually kept the registers in memory. Uh, but the uh, biggest one, you built them on the transistors. So that was a, a, a breakthrough. And amazingly enough, with small changes, that idea is from the early 1960s survives today. There is still a line that's descended from that first computer in the 60s that have a very similar instruction set. The same instructions still run today, uh, almost 70 years later. Uh, and by the way, uh, this is why this IBM embedded the 8-bit byte. Before that, characters were 6 bits or 9 bits, depending on the computer. But they had this idea of an 8-bit byte. Now, if you were was a few people like me. This was the first computer you learned to program, and because you often programmed in assembly language, they had a reference card that you could look at that would list all the instructions of the IBM C60 instruction set. And this is referred to as a green card because of the color of the card. But that was the whole 360 instruction set. There's three panels on each side, and you could look at that and uh, write your programs in assembly language. So for the people of that era, they spent a lot of time with those green cards, a lot of time studying it. So uh, there's, there's nostalgic about green cards, and you probably people want to buy them, original green cards on eBay, so they can have them from the good old days. Uh, now, back then, and it's true today, there's two parts to a computer. There's the processing part, kind of the brawn of the computer that does the work, and there's the brain that tells it what to do. And it's as true today as it was then. The hard part of designing a processor is to design the control, the brain part. And so they were going to have to, with all these different price points, figure out how to do control for these different designs, from the cheapest to the most expensive. Um, and they needed a technical idea that this happened. Well, Maurice Wilkes of Cambridge, where Christo Zanovich is uh, spending his uh, sabbatical, He's one of the computer pioneers. He built one of the very first computers. He had this idea that control, because he knew that was the hard part of doing control, could be kind of like programming, and that you could specify control in memory, 
And then the programming of that memory is kind of like programming and distinguish it from regular programming. You call it microprogramming. In the technology of that time, uh, logic was a lot, uh, was expensive compared to read-only memory or read-write memory. And read-only memory was cheaper than read-write memory, and it was a lot faster. So his idea was we would specify control, or people, processor designers could specify control, using read-only memory that you could think of it like programming microprogramming. So he published that idea in 1958. It was just an academic paper that was out there, but it caught the attention of the IBM designers because they needed an argument as how they could build lots of different types of computers with the same instruction set. And they decided that microprogramming was the key, so they bet their idea of the IBM 360 on this kind of unproven academic idea of microprogramming. So when they announced it, uh, this is what it looked like. So they actually announced, uh, I think, six or seven different models, but here are the four main ones. So as you can see, uh, the smallest model was only 8 bits wide, and the, the largest was 64 bit wide. The size of this microprogramming varied. So the, the, for the cheapest one, it was 50 bits wide, and for the most expensive one, it was 87 bits wide. So the idea that there was more in the data path control, and uh, it took more micro instructions to do the cheapest one because they were longer. It would take more clock cycles to do it. The speed of the memory varied again. They wanted to have different price points, so the the cheapest one was three quarters of a microsecond, and the fastest one was a fifth of a microsecond. And the main memory technologies were different. This was done in core memory, and you see the cheapest one had uh, 1,500 nanoseconds, and the fastest one was twice as fast. And then, at the time, what IBM would do is rather than sell you a computer, they would rent it to you. So, the, in using uh, you know 50-year-old prices, it was the $50,000 a year to 270,000. If we took, if we accounted for inflation. That's from a half a million dollars a year for the cheapest one to three million dollars a year for the most expensive one. And that's to rent it for just one year. So IBM, the, the technical leaders of IBM had this vision of combining all of the instruction sets behind a single instruction set, and they bet the company that this would be successful. So the, 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 the vice president of hearing went to the president of IBM and said, this is going to work. If we're going to bet the company's going to work. If it doesn't work, we go out of business. And they won the bet. So that idea won, and they made a lot of money. <laughs> the idea that you could pick your poison, you could pick what price point you wanted to buy, and then if you needed more, you just spend more, and you pay an annual fee to IBM to use it. And it, IBM was very, very profitable with this, this idea. So this is a, a, a you know, milestone in computer architecture, the invention of what we call binary compatibility today. The same program ran on all these different computers. And since that time, there's practically been, uh, almost nobody has been as bold as this to announce six different models of computers at different price points on the same day. Uh, that's still a remarkable uh, milestone. So what happened in forward in time? Well, instead of building things out of uh, independent transistors, we started building them out of my, uh, out of uh, integrated circuits, MOS integrated circuits. So what happened when we went to building them out of integrated circuits is everything was kind of the same speed. You're building them out of the same transistors, the logic, the RAM, and the ROM. And in the semiconductor, there was no performance difference between the ROM and the RAM. And, and Moore's Law is in full bloom in this time, so it's doubling the number of transistors every year or two. So we had suddenly had, every year or two, we had more transistors. What are we going to do with that? Well, what people did with this microprogrammed approach is they built much bigger microprograms uh, because it was easy to do. So what would you do with much bigger microprograms? Well, you could build really complicated instruction sets. It, since the ROM was the fastest memory, you could kind of, uh, you could build things into the ROM and run faster than if you built them in the same memory. So this is what we call the complex instruction sets, very complicated instruction sets. And a really good example of that was uh, from the company Digital Equipment Corporation called the VAX. And it came out in 1978, and uh, it was a very popular computer. The predecessor was a 16-bit address computer, 
and it had run out of address bits, and this was a th the first 32-bit uh, computer. These were called mini computers back then. They were about the sizes of file cabinets. Now, uh, what happened in the microprocessors, microprocessors had been invented, but they were just kind of toys, but they were following Moore's law. But the people who made microprocessors really didn't understand computer architecture. That was what the people who built uh, mainframe computers like IBM or mini computers like a Digital Equipment Corporation. So what the microprocessor people would do, would study the manuals of the mini computer manufacturers and mainframe manufacturers and imitate them. That's, that's how they did it. They did, you know, they were semiconductor design, chip designers and semiconductor processing manufacturers. They did not, they were computer architects. Uh, so, but amazingly enough, Gordon Moore of Moore's Law, who was the president of Intel at the time, he taught, had a friend at Digital Equipment Corporation called Gordon Bell, who, the people who made the facts, and they would get together and compare notes. Well, he realized, Moore realized with Moore's Law, eventually we would quickly go from 8-bit microprocessors to 16-bit microprocessors to 32-bit microprocessors. And he had the insight in uh, about the 1970s, I guess this was uh, about 73, 74, that they'd done an 8-bit microprocessor, but the next one that they did, that whatever that instruction set is, they'd be stuck with for the rest of the life of the company. So he, he could see the future, and so we gotta get this next one right. So what he did was hire lots of PhDs in computer science and put them not where uh, Intel was located in Santa Clara in California, but put them 500 miles away in Portland all by themselves, and they were supposed to invent the future of Intel. And uh, so they uh, had a project that was called the Intel 432, but it was gonna be the, the big address computer that Intel was gonna be, live with forever. So they decided that security was gonna be important, so they built what was called a capability-based architecture and a very ambitious design. Uh, and it relied on that microcode, you know, really big microprograms. And in fact, it was so big and so ambitious, it didn't fit on one chip. So they, they built a microprocessor that took multiple chips that fit the microcode. Not only that, when they went back to Gordon Moore and he said, okay, you know, we're gonna need a 16-bit microprocessor in 1978. They said, well, we've got some bad news. It's fantastic, it's gonna invent the future. In fact, they were so confident it would invent the future that if you applied for a job there, they wouldn't tell you what they were doing. They just trust us, it's fantastic, if you sign with us, we'll let you know what we work on. But if you, we're not going to tell you. And they were confident. But when they went to Gordon Moore and they said, uh, we've got some, well, we're making great progress, but by the way, it's not going to be ready. We are not going to have a 16-bit micro microprocessor successor in 1978. I'm, I'm sorry, it'll take us a few more years. So what happened was, there was an emergency at Intel. They had to have a, a microprocessor with the 16-bit addressing. So uh, given the Portland, Oregon people weren't going to deliver on time, they threw a group together, and this group of people came up with instruction set collectively in 10 man weeks. So 10 weeks of thought by uh, three or four people went into that instruction set. And Gordon Moore was right. They are stuck with that 10-week design forever. <laughs> the x86 architecture was specified in oh, three weeks of time by three people, 10 weeks of thought went into the x86 architecture. And, uh, and it has the kind of a funny architecture, but they had to get it done in 10 weeks. Not only that, but they had to design a chip that they could sell within 12 months. So they had to do everything in an emergency because the Portland group was late. So I, I think Gordon Moore's projection of the future of, of that Moore's law is gonna continue is one of the most astounding technology predictions of all time. If you go back and read the original paper where he projects Moore's law, he talks about the consequences of what it would mean. And this is in 1965. He says, well, if, we, if Moore's law is gonna keep going, we'll be able to have microprocessors, whole computers small enough that you could put them in things. And the, there's cartoons showing uh, in cars and in microwaves and all this stuff. It was fantastic vision. So I've often wondered if Gordon Moore was a time traveler, right? He wasn't really that good at prediction. He just traveled in time. He just went forward 40 years. He said, oh yeah, 
The transistor is really big. I'll go back and take credit for that. Right? And then he and then he looked. He went forward in time and he saw. He said, "Oh, look! Intel's got this awful instruction set. I'll just go back in time, hire these PhDs, and they'll we'll have a wonderful instruction set." But whenever, if you watch a time travel movie, it never works, right? You go, you go forward, you see what's wrong, you go back, and you change it, and somehow fate doesn't let that happen. So that's what I think would happen with the x86 instruction set. He was just a time traveler. He tried to change the future, but but fate made him stick with this terrible instruction set. So, so, so now you know where it came from. It was time travel and history. So what happened? Well, the x86 architecture in 1978 wasn't that popular. It, there was a much more attractive instruction set from Motorola, but Motorola was late. And so there's this other company, IBM of all companies, the company that makes its mainframe, wanted to get into the home marketplace to sell things to consumers. So they started a project in Florida to build a computer for, the, for an individual person. And they needed a microprocessor to be announced in 1981. Well, uh, Motorola's microprocessor, which was much instruction set, much like the IBM 360, is what they wanted to use, but it wasn't ready, and they needed to ship this uh, microprocessor. So they picked the 8088 uh, and uh, put it into their thing. And they thought it would sell maybe 200,000. Instead, they sold hundreds of millions. So that's the, the fate. <laughs> they, Gordon Moore wanted to pick the future, have a great instruction set, they ran out of time, they had an emergency instruction set, but fortunately for them, IBM picked them in the IBM PC, and the success of the PC personal computer made this architecture the most popular in the world. Okay, so that's what happened. Now, what did scientists think about this microcode machine? Well, John Cock, who is a famous scientist, Turing Award winner at IBM, and a brilliant individual, a, a genius, uh, had this idea of Instead of building a microcode interpreter, we could build just simple instructions out of hardware. So they did a project building out of a very advanced technology, very power uh, intensive, called ECL bipolar technology. And they also had very advanced compiler technology. A lot of uh, what John Cock did was invent uh, great compiler technology. And so the first thing that they did was take this compiler and for the IBM instruction set, they didn't use all of the instructions. They used a subset of instructions, the simple instructions. So what happened was, shockingly, by using the simple instructions of the IBM 360, programs ran three times faster. So the complicated instructions that used up a lot of the microcode weren't all that useful. They didn't help performance. The same thing happened at digital equipment that made the VAX architecture with its complex instruction set architecture. Uh, a couple of their engineers studied the design. They found that 20% of the instructions were responsible for 60% of the microcode, but was used less than 1% of the time. So again, vast amounts of microcode weren't all that useful. I took a sabbatical, uh, I don't know if it was a good idea, but as an assistant professor in my third year, I took a sabbatical of digital equipment. And because of my dissertation was about tools for microcode, uh, and I was there to help uh, with get bugs out of microcode. And the VAX, which was a very complicated instruction set, had hundreds of bugs in it. So when I came back from that, I, I decided that uh, if what was going to happen was that the microprocessor people were going to imitate the mini computer people, that meant they were going to probably build instruction sets as complicated as the VAX instruction set. But what that meant was they were going to have to fix bugs after the chip shipped. And so I came back from my sabbatical and wrote a paper, and the paper said, well, this is what's going to happen. We're going to have more complicated construction sets, and so we're going to have to figure out a way to repair microprocessors in the field to fix the microcode bugs. So what happened to that paper, because I was convinced that we had to do, the paper was rejected. The reviewers said, this is a stupid way to design microprocessors to make really complicated instruction sets that had bugs in it to the microcode. So I was stuck with these two notions in my head, which was, well, they're probably going to imitate the microprocessor people, but if they do, they're going to build stupid microprocessors that had to be fixed. And I agree, that's a stupid sign. So what's the solution? Right? So that, that led my work uh, uh, and the work that, that uh, John Hennessy at Stanford did in kind of going from com complex instruction set computers to reduced instruction set computers. The basic idea is the, read, the RAM memory, the multiple memory that used to have microcode in it, Instead of having a microcode interpreter, we just put in simple instructions, and that memory would become an instruction cache. That's the basic idea. 
And then the instructions would be simple and easy to pipeline. And so instead of uh, having this microcode, you could have compiled code running out of this very fast memory. Uh, and the pipelining allowed to have a better clock rate. Uh, and finally, in terms of Moore's law, if you kept the instructions that simple, you could fit a 32-bit microprocessor in one chip. The people in Portland, Oregon, with their complicated instructions that needed three chips, but with a RISC processor, you could fit it all in one chip. Uh, and that was much more economical than when you could fit in one chip. Now, it was hard to explain uh, why since the RISC instructions were more were simpler, you'd have to execute more of them than CISC instructions. In fact, I just gave a talk at Chang Hong yesterday in Chengdu, and that was my first question. Well, when you say that RISC-V is better than ARM, uh, don't you have to execute more instructions for RISC-V than you do for ARM? ARM's more complicated, so you don't have to execute as many. So how can you say it's faster? That was my first question there. So I, I'll explain the answer to that. So uh, at the performance of a computer, you can say, is the time per program, and you can factor that into three factors. There's the instructions you execute per, uh, per program, and that's what they were talking about, about the ARM executing maybe less than those. And that depends on the program itself and the, the, how good your compilers are and the instructions there. The second factor is the average number of clock cycles per instruction, and that depends on the instruction set and the, the hardware underneath it. And the last one is the clock rate, the time per clock cycle. And that depends on the microarchitecture and the technology you're building with. So we, that was a new idea that came out uh, a few years after the risk ideas came out. And that uh, John Hennessy made the observation that seems obvious now, but was intuitive, uh, that was surprising at that time. But it could explain why risk is a better idea, is that risk executes more instructions per program, the first factor is bigger, but many fewer clock cycles per instruction. So the average number of clock cycles instructions is less. So that was my answer in Chandu yesterday is yes, sometimes it executes more instructions, but the clock cycles per instruction is often less and, and the chip is smaller as well. So that's why risk is faster than this. Okay. So that's the explanation. So at the time, uh, this was in uh, 1982, which was a couple of years ago. <laughs> This, we would, uh, students at Berkeley built a chip, it only had 45,000 transistors, um, and it, uh, the first one, and the first one on the right is called RISC-1, and then the second one that's down here at the bottom is RISC-2, that was a much better design, it was uh, done by just two students, the, the first one was done by five students using the tools at the time, and it ran easily three times faster and with fewer transistors. Uh, so, uh, as Krista will say, so these two projects, we call them RISC-1 and RISC-2. You can, you can barely see the name up there, but uh, the people who did this one, it's pretty easy to see, but that's RISC-2. <laughs> you can, you can, it's visible on the chip. Well, we actually did two more projects after that design, and I called the second one, was for Smalltalk, which is an object language, language Smalltalk on a RISC, and then the third one was for LISP processing on a RISC, on a RISC and it's called Symbolic processing using risk or spur. And I was at a meeting where I met uh, the person who invented the programming language, Pascal, Nicholas Berf, Pascal, and module and things like that. And he said, you know, he told me, I wish I had just called them Pascal 1, Pascal 2, Pascal 3, rather than new names all the time. It's funny, I, that's the same thing I wish I'd done. I wish I'd called them risk 1, risk 2, risk 3, risk 4. I, I should have just stuck with it. It was a winning name. And, and so I told that story to the Krista and uh, Yunsa and Andrew Waterman, who were building the next risk instruction, said, this is, ah, that's a great idea. We'll call this next one risk five. <laughs> so it's the fifth Berkeley one. There's a little disconnect. The, the first four were in the 80s. The next ones were 30 years later, but it's part of that continuum. Besides the Berkeley work, there was work done by uh, John Hennessy at Stanford University on the MIPS microprocessor. MIPS actually stands for microprocessor without interlock pipeline stages. That's where they came up with the name. And as Stanford uh, universities want to do, they not only did this microprocessor inside the university, but they started a company with the same name. Uh, the instruction sets don't have anything to do with each other, but the name stuck with it. And MIPS processors are still sold today. I think on the order of 350, no, 750 million MIPS processors are shipped every year uh, still to this day. So what happened? 
So this was this risk versus cis area. It, was, it led to a lot of debates at conferences. This was a heated topic. People got angry about risk versus cis. Oh, this is a terrible idea, this is good. So what happened was, in the personal computer era, what Intel cleverly did was take these complicated instructions and in hardware translate them into simple instructions and execute those simple risk instructions inside. Therefore, any good idea that came up in the risk community, they could use and still be binary compatibility, paddle this idea that IBM came up with a long time before. And eventually, they got up to selling 350 million x86 chips a year, which is amazing. And so Intel eventually, did I start to say, dominated all the servers as well as all, all the desktops. Um, that's, you know, the post, the, the uh, personal computer era. We are now not in the personal computer era anymore. Personal computer sales are dropping. Well, we are in the post PC era, where everything is in the client and the cloud. So the cloud is amazingly big, and the clients are these things that all of us carry with us. Uh, mobile devices and internet of things. Uh, in terms of the size of the cloud, uh, I'm, uh, I, re I retired from Berkeley uh, nine months ago, but I've been spending a lot of time working on textbooks. <laughs> oh, that reminds me. <laughs> I, I will leave this here. <laughs> uh, so one of, well, let me do that as long as I remember. I remember. So one of the textbooks is the undergraduate textbook, and we just came out with the RISC-V version of that undergraduate textbook. So, uh, and thanks to Andrew, and Young's up here, they did the translation. Um, it was available as of like a week ago. So you can, if you go to Amazon, you can get a copy of it. And uh, it's somehow, it was exciting, to, even though we were involved, it was exciting to see the book with RISC-V in it. It makes it seem more real, the not what's in the textbook. Uh, we had something to do with it, but it still feels good. Uh, there's also, uh, we're doing the, the, right now, I just finished with my uh, colleague, John Hennessy, we just finished the revision of the graduate level textbook. And I just finished the section on cloud computing. So I estimated uh, how big is Amazon's cloud computing. And looking at some data that was published, I estimated they might have 100 data centers, 100 warehouse scale computers. So each of those uh, data centers has cost more than $200 million for each one. And each of them has 50,000 to 100,000 servers. Each of them uses maybe 32 megawatts. So that's where they are today. And uh, James Hamilton, who's one of the lead thought leaders at Amazon about them, he speculated about how many ultimately will they need. So as he extrapolated into the future, and if you're going to be a serious cloud company, he projected that you would need 10,000 data centers. 10,000 data centers. So uh, 100 times more data centers than today. So each of those, 32 megawatts, $200 million. So the cloud is going to be kind of everything going into the cloud, so the middle evaporates, and then the rest of the things being the cloud. So what instruction sets dominates the post-PC era? Well, first of all, it's, it's in a system on a chip and not a separate microprocessor like Intel makes. And they value diet area and energy as much as they value performance. Uh, but last year, it was uh, more than 18 billion. So 15 billion, and they're 98% risk processors, right? So it's uh, ARM is 15 billion, Tensilica and ARC, these are both, all the rest of these are risk processors. So, so in the post-PC era, it's unquestionably that risk won. So we lost the PC era and won the post-PC era. Since we're living in the post-PC era, that's, I think I'd rather win that one than the one that, the one that's over. But that's it, so that's like a whole, so how do we settle things in computer architecture? Well, we have these debates at conferences and then companies spend billions of dollars trying to figure out which is the best idea. <laughs> and, uh, and then after spending billions of dollars, you know, it looks like a risk on that argument. Okay, that was the 1980s through today. But there was another set of ideas that, that competed with risk, and that was called very long instruction group. And the idea was, let's try and have lots of operations specified in instruction, but we could have really wide instructions, so maybe 500-bit long instructions. And we'll have that parallelism instruction, and that will allow us to build faster computers. Uh, in this example, we've got space for two integer operations, two memory operations, and two floating point operations. And the idea for very long instruction work was to keep the hardware pretty simple, and we'll just put everything into the compiler. So it's the compiler's responsibility, if there's any dependencies between instructions, to schedule it. And I'll show you what that looks like. 
Uh, and the hope was that we could build very fast, very efficient hardware, and the compiler can make that easy to do. So it had to, the compiler was kind of king in this. It had to maximize the parallel execution. It had to guarantee uh, the, the depend, parallelism between instructions, and it had to avoid interlocks. There's no interlocks in the hardware. It had to avoid data hazards. So if there were dependencies, it was up to the software to make sure everything was right. So where did it get the parallelism to do that? A, a typical thing to do would it be either in roll loops. So here's an example of the original code, and if it was unrolled four times, we could have execute potentially all those four instructions in parallel. And so if we turn that into uh, instructions, that's the four unrolled loops, and then it was up to the compiler to schedule it. And you can see there's potentially six instructions, strict operations per instruction, but there's lots of empty space on that slide. So, uh, and that's, that compiler had to do that. And so you could, there's a couple of places where there's this one place you can do three operations at once, but a lot of time there wasn't anything to put in there. But that was the bet for VLIW. So uh, Intel, back remember, it made that transition to the 32-bit instructions, from, to 16-bit instructions, or they, they went to 16-bit, and then 32-bit uh, with x86, but it was time to go above 32-bit. So they realized it was an opportunity for them to save, change the instruction set up here. Here's, we could have an excuse we could change the instruction set up. Now, what had happened for Intel is they had licensed AMD that they could also build uh, x86 architectures. Because early on in the semiconductor industry, you had to have a second source. People were afraid you would go out of business, so they said, oh, we're not going to buy your chips unless you have a second source. So Intel licensed it to AMD. Well, that was a decision they regretted because they had to compete with AMD for the x86 architecture. Later on, companies became so big, people didn't worry about them going out of business, so they didn't have to do it anymore. So Intel thought, when we go from 32-bit to 64-bit, we can change architectures, and we won't have to license it to AMD. We'll just do a new instruction set. But they needed an idea to bet on, and they bet on VLIW. They called it EPIC instead for explicitly parallel instruction computing, but it was kind of a version of VLIW. So they, they said the future of the industry of the microprocessor is EPIC, uh, and what they called their EPIC design was Itanium, and they were very good in publicity and said, this is the future, uh, you should get on board. Now the very first one they did was late, just like the 432, it was four years late. And they said, well don't, don't, that one doesn't count. <laughs> the second one, which was, uh, came out the following year, was a much better design, and they did one more after that. So what happened with this bet, you know, another multi-billion dollar bet in instructions and architecture, what happened to VLAW? Well, it was an epic failure, as we can see. So the problem was they had unpredictable branches, right? So, so branches aren't predictable, it's hard to, for the compiler to schedule that code. There was variable latency for memory accesses because cache missions aren't so predictable, so that was really hard for compilers to schedule on that. The, the instructions themselves were much wider than 32-bit, uh, so the programs were bigger that could affect the cache hit rate, but the biggest problem was the compilers. The technology bet that they could build in fantastic compilers, and as Donald Knuth of Stanford, who was a, a you know, compiler expert and a Turing Award winner, said, the Itanium approach was supposed to be terrific until it turned out that the wish for compilers were basically impossible to write. So the hardware people bet that compiler technology could deliver on their vision of very easy to build hardware that's very wide, and it turned out it wasn't true. Now, uh, by the time this became obvious, uh, Intel had been beating the drum for the uh, Itanium architecture for the last, for three years, right? And, the whole industry was convinced that this was the future. And not only was Intel involved, Hewlett Packard, a significant manufacturer, was joined forces. So Intel and HP said that the future is epic. You have to get on board. And many companies abandoned what they did. Silicon Graphics, one of the big users of MIPS, where John Hennessy uh, worked, they abandoned MIPS and went with Itanium because Intel said it was the future. Many companies did that. So when it came out that it looked like the compilers weren't going to work, so the performance wasn't there, it became kind of a joke in the industry uh, because you know, the, the, these giant companies had made so much fanfare. And so to illustrate the joke, this 
company, the, the chip that was called Itanium, somebody decided that to rename it the Itanic after the Titanic. So if you've seen the movie Titanic, it collides, see, and you know, uh, the, the, every, every, almost everybody dies. So what this cartoon shows is the companies abandoning ship in the lifeboats, like Oracle was abandoning ships, while Hewlett Packard and Intel sink into the horizon. And in fact, uh, you know, the Itanium, they, they still make them today, and they, they sell maybe a thousand a year or something like that. So billions of dollars based on this interesting kind of scientific idea. How do we figure it out? We spend billions of dollars, try the marketplace, and whoops, didn't work. So, so what's the consensus on instruction sets today? Uh, it's not risk. I mean, it's not SIS. No, that's the wrong <laughs> That's a, that'd be a surprise. It's, it's not, it's not SIS. There have been no SIS architectures. No one's built a SIS architecture in more than 30 years. It's not VLIW. Uh, it, for general purpose computing, the, the, the VLIW didn't work. Its complexity was pretty close to the ones that, uh, uh, no real advantage there, and, but they are useful in the embedded marketplace. You know, for narrower markets, the VLIWs work, but as the foundation for general purpose computing, it just, it just didn't turn out. Risk, risk is still a good idea. Who would have thought, you know, in this fast moving field, the thing, the first project I worked on when I was assistant, untenured professor, that who would have thought by the time I retired, it's still a good idea, yeah, but uh, it's kind of remarkable. All right, so the, uh, the next couple slides before I do the questions kind of does the big picture of what's going on. So microprocessor design, studying progress in 40 years, right? They're, it basically, microprocessors are a million times faster. The first had to do with what we call computer architecture. Maybe a factor of a thousand there and a factor of a thousand with technology. So we went from 8-bit microprocessors to 64-bit microprocessors. The, what's called instruction level parallelism, the instructions on the VAX with the microcode interpreter uh, 40 years ago, it would take 10 clock cycles per instruction. The average number of clock cycles per instruction could be 10 because of the microcode interpreter. Today, it's not clock cycles per instructions, it's instructions per clock cycle. So launching four instructions per clock cycle instead of one in 10, so there's a big speed up there. And then we switched over to multiple processors per chip, which is called multi-core. So another factor of 16 multiplies those together into a factor of 1,000. The clock rate's gone up by a factor of 1,000. And that's you know, due to Moore's law and due to faster uh, technology, but also ar some architecture work. So the enabling technologies was Moore's law that's doubling every year or two. And a lesser known but extremely important observation called Denard scaling. Denard noticed in this observation in the late 70s that basically every time you shrank the transistor, you could reduce the power that it needs. So for a, a constant area of silicon, the power would remain constant despite packing many more transistors in it. Otherwise, it would be a problem in terms of power. So those things fueled it for a long time. What's happened more recently is the end of this golden age. So Denard scaling stopped working maybe 10 or 15 years ago, so power became key, key constraint. Uh, Moore's law is over, you know, apparently if you work for Intel, you have to sign a loyalty oath that if you go to any meeting that you defend Moore's law, you claim it's not over. Uh, now, but just factually, you know, micro, Intel microprocessors don't, aren't doubling in transitions every few years. DRAMs have flattened out, DRAMs aren't going, so it, it's over, but unless you work for Intel, it is. From the architecture side, we kind of ran out of ideas, the instruction level parallelism, up to about four instructions works more than that, it's just very inefficient. And then Amdahl's law, an observation that was made 50 years ago this year, that parallelism is limited by the sequential part. So that if there's a sequential piece that's 10%, no matter how many processors you put in, you can't go more than a factor of 10 and then switch the things. So I captured this together in a, uh, in a graph, my career in, in one slide. So the early years of my career, it was CIS construction sets and VAXs, and that doubled the performance every three and a half years. Then became the good old, the risk era, where we doubled every year and a half, we kept up with Moore's Law. We, but then that ran into the Denard scaling ended, and the power became the limit, so we switched over to multi-core from single core, one inefficient core by lots of, uh, lots of uh, efficient cores. But Amdahl's law limited the benefit of how putting lots of cores on it. And then, in fact, this chart came from 
this textbook that I've done with John Hennessy, and this is the first figure in the book. And I had just, the last, it last came out in 2011, and I was updating this slide. And I shockingly realized when I looked at the data, this is based on spec data, that Intel microprocessors are not getting that much better. Uh, and uh, at first I just drew a straight line between them, but then I looked more carefully, and so, you know, since about 2015, they're hardly faster at all. So single-threaded performance on even Intel microprocessors, whoops, Intel microprocessors have gone up maybe 3%. So rather than saying single-thread performance is not gonna get any faster, I'll just say it'll take 20 years. And from my perspective, 20 years and never pretty much the same. <laughs> so that's it, so single-threaded performance have come to a stop. So what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? Uh, since transistors are not getting uh, much better and the power budget isn't getting bigger, and uh, we've already done the switch from one efficient processor to lots of efficient processors, there's the only path left is domain-specific architectures that will do just a few tasks but do them extremely well. And, uh, and an example of that is the uh, tensor processing unit that uh, Google announced a, a few weeks ago where it's a factor of 30 to 80 better in performance per watt for GPU. So in commercial products, factors of, of two are a big deal. The fact that these numbers are so big is pretty amazing. So what do we want from an instruction set? Well, look, we want it to be open, modular, with a good software stack, and lots of opcode space for special purpose instructions. So my last slide before I open for questions is, you know, I think we're gonna enter another, another golden <coughs> age, just like back in the risk days where things went incredibly fast. The reason is, first of all, the end of two enabling technologies. The end of Denard scaling and Moore's law means that we want better energy cost performance, we need innovation in architecture. So kind of the <coughs> semiconductor processing guys have tossed that over to the architects. Here, you guys figure out how to make it faster. Uh, this potential synergy between domain-specific architectures and domain-specific languages. So it's always been the case that somebody could build a, a unusual piece of hardware that has very high potential performance, but how do you map the software to it? Our software colleagues, for their own reasons, are developing domain-specific languages to improve their productivity within certain domains. So an example is Google TensorFlow. So for the Google uh, TPU, the Translation Processing Unit, the number of lines of code that mapped onto it were like from 100 lines of TensorFlow to 1,000 lines of TensorFlow. So it was a much easier task to map it to that hardware. So I think this will work for other domain-specific languages. So that's a reason I think it's exciting. And the third thing is really just that we can, it's a perfect time to do chip innovation and that we have amazing technology to do it, much better than, than when, uh, when I was an assistant professor. There's field programmable gate arrays that you can change every day and it runs, you know, it runs 50 or 100 megahertz fast enough to do lots of clock cycles. And it's a lot easier to build custom chips today instead of what architects did of just doing software simulators which aren't very convincing. So as we'll hear about, we can, RISC-V reduces the software part of the cost of non-recurring engineering. There's an effort that's called free chips where people will share open cores so that would reduce the hardware part of it. There's better productivity via uh, agile development models that, that uh, Jan Sipley and others have talked about and brand new tools that make it much better for like Chisel. And you can do incredibly cheap test chips it doesn't show uh, on the slide there, but you can get 100 chips in 28 nanometers for just $30,000. So this is a really exciting time. And with that, I will stop for questions. Thank you. Uh, uh, Charles Pax, Pax Instruments. Um, so $30,000 for a cheap test chip. What technology is that with? Is that the most modern stuff? And can you do uh, can you do it cheaper with? Can you do it cheaper with older, worse technology? Uh, Krista probably knows the answers. I, I, we 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 did an op-ed piece in the Times because I couldn't believe how cheap it is. It's it was 28 nanometer TSMC technology. It's basically I would say what happened is it's always been test chips. And it's because you ch you check a, people would try a circuit and get it back. The difference is between Moore's law is the tiny test chip, which is about a little bit less than three millimeters squared, has millions of transistors in it. So that test chip suddenly is kind of interesting. So the work that Yunsef Lee and others did 
their insight of doing chips rapidly is, is, is if you kept the chip small, you could avoid a lot of the problems of a big chip in terms of making it work. And it was pretty cheap that you could iterate. So anybody can go to TSMC and get in the latest technology for about $30,000 a handful of test chips. They're not tested, you have to do that yourself, but it's remarkably cheap. Um, and, and older technologies is cheaper, right? Do you know the numbers, Krista? Yeah, so the numbers are used, uh, these are public, because actually ST28 nanometer, uh, with the code is... Oh, it's ST28? ST28, and the CMP is the, you know, multi-project wafer place. So Mose is a similar program, so the technologies, and so um, all the technology even cheaper, like I think for 180 nanometer, there are people advertising short runs for $3,000. $3,000 for getting 100 chips. <laughs> yes, you can't use money as an excuse. The idea is, the multi-chip thing is, on a single die, they put lots of projects, and then they cut them all up and ruin the other ones, but there's a few left. And so that technology's been around a long time. It's just with Moore's Law, it's pretty interesting that number of transistors. Ms. Kenneth Lin, I work in Tongji University. Uh, Professor Pedersen, uh, where would the architecture innovation, uh, did you speculate, will be? Where will, where will innovation be? Yeah. <laughs> with the most potential uh, for oh, architecture well, innovation? Yeah, uh, well, I'll, make, I'll interpret that question in my own. I think it's widely believed in the architecture community that domain-specific architectures are the future. Uh, you know, Intel's you know, got great engineers, smart people. If they can't figure out a way to make general purpose computing go faster, uh, that seems hard. It's hard for me to figure that out. We've tried lots of things. Also. In the arc, if you just read the computer architecture papers for the last decade, people trying to make general purpose uh, computers faster, there'll be papers claiming 6% improvement. So this is 6% improvement based on simulators, right? So there's a chance in the research paper, if you claim 6%, it's less than 6%. And these, this is research papers. So I think making general purpose computers go a lot faster just with architecture seems like a pretty tough place. So the Google, TPU that I was involved uh, in, in uh, writing that paper and, and reflecting on it is instead of what happened in the, in the architecture community for the last decade, instead of 10% gains or less using a simulator, Google built hardware that had factors of 10 or more, right? That's amazing. Factors of 10 are, is an amazing difference. So I think this idea of, well, we're going to need to, as architects, know more about domains. So, because in the past we kind of, I don't know what I don't know what the C program does. I'm just going to study it. the C program as an artifact. We're going to have to understand the domain and uh, go into it. Uh, when Hennessy gave this talk at Stanford with me, the slides I borrowed from, he mentioned besides deep learning, which uh, you know I worked on, he mentioned uh, virtual reality, uh, graphics. Um, more kind of probably lots of uh, human interfacing things, visual things, as areas that we could learn more about. But I think architects are going to have to go in, under, help understand the ideas, work closely with in hardware software interface. So that out, you want to you don't want to build hardware for the wrong algorithm, right? So you want to work with algorithm designers, software people, and hardware people. We're going to need to form teams like that. But then you know there's apparently huge gains that are available. And so I think what many people believe, I know Krista believes this, is that the future of architecture will be more heterogeneous. And you know, the idea of having a common base instruction set where you have uh, co-processors that are invoked when you need them or included when you need them, and you have huge uh, gains there. That I, think, that, I think that's conventional wisdom uh, right now, and I, I share that. Uh, ISC and macro-architecture, which one is more uh, important in your idea? Because uh, many people instruction sets versus micro architecture, micro -architecture. Well, and I ask which one is more important. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I think uh, surprisingly, uh, like I said, based on my my forty years, surprisingly there's we agree on there's widespread agreement on instruction set design. Uh, so uh, we don't need lots of instruction sets, right? We just need a good one. You know, this idea that we could have a common instruction set and we'd all uh, embrace it and then as a community improve the implementations and share the implementations like our colleagues do in operating systems and compilers. 
The operating system community largely uses Linux. We did a research project at Berkeley that did our own operating system and submitted it to the main operating system conference. And, and their feedback was, why didn't you use Linux? Yeah, okay. And similarly, the compiler community has largely standardized around ALVM. So I think the architecture community has an opportunity to, to set aside our differences and agree in a common instruction set. And then we'll have the benefits of, of being able to compare different microarchitectures with the same instruction set and see which ones work. So I would say, uh, uh, you know, for general purpose computing, I think, you know, there seems to be, we agree on what a good instruction set looks like and, you know, we should include that and then innovate below that. Uh, in terms of the microarchitecture, uh, I think there's more room to innovate on domain specific ones. So the Google TPU uh, that ran so much faster, it has 65,000 multiplied accumulate units on it. 65,000. <laughs> so that's a very different uh, microarchitecture than you would find in a general purpose CPU. So I would say, micro, you know, agree on instruction set, that's pretty standard, and then innovate uh, both probably at instructions for special purpose things and the microarchitecture up the, below it. This is Johnny from uh, CSKY. Uh, uh, it's a great talk, thanks a lot. And my question is on the uh, brain like computers, like IBM, so who knows, you have any comments on that? The green brain, uh, brain like brain -like computers. computers. Yeah, yeah I think there's been, uh, uh, it was, you know, I've been at Google for about nine months. It's been really interesting for me to learn about uh, deep learning. And it's, I, 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 don't, I don't think I have the slides to show you. It's a really simple idea. The artificial neuron that it's inspired by the brain is just a weighted sum. It's the weighted sum of weights in your inputs, and then you put that through a very simple uh, nonlinear function. And the most popular one today is simply max, you know, number zero. So if it's, if it's negative, make it zero, and if it's positive, it's okay. So weighted sum through a max function, that's the artificial neuron that people use. So it's brain inspired, so, uh, and that, it, and this deep learning stuff works amazingly well. That, that simple idea, you do lots of those operations, and you put them into layers and stack them up, has a, helped, uh, you know, Google use that to help uh, beat uh, the world champion at Go uh, last year, which is something, you know, no, people thought wouldn't happen for another decade. So that's a really simple idea, and so it's brain inspired. There's also work that people do where they try to imitate the brain, in part to understand how the brain works. That's pretty interesting. But the spiking neuron model that I think is useful for understanding the brain, so far I haven't seen, uh, these people haven't entered the competitions with that technology. So what happened in deep neural networking is in 2012, uh, Jeff Hinton and some people at Toronto uh, were trying to convince people that a certain type of neural network was best for vision. And so they, he talked to one of my colleagues, how come you don't believe us? And he said, well, you don't enter the competitions. So, so if we, he said, if we enter the ImageNet competition and we win, will you believe us? He said, yes, I will. And so they entered and they, uh, they use a convolutional neural network and they won the ImageNet competition in 2012 and they did their calculation in GPU. Two years, and they were the only one that used, uh, used convolutional neural nets. Everybody else used older algorithms. Two years later, 100% of the people use convolutional neural nets. So, you know, if you've got an interesting technology, what's nice about this benchmarking or competitions, enter it, and let's see how you do. So far, uh, IBM hasn't entered any of these competitions, so it's hard for us to hard for us to see evidence that it's a better idea. Peter Chung from uh, Huawei. Uh, so my question is regarding the, uh, when you said that uh, open source architecture will be the future of uh, all the computings. But then those problems are normally created by uh, having a solution for particular applications, where when you put them all together, probably the cost of the solutions might be too expensive for a lot of customers. So how did you resolve the cases that you need the performance, but at the same time reduce up the cost in the case? Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, well, I think, you know, we've switched over from kind of microprocessors where you buy a chip from Intel and you, you get everything in there to systems on a chip. And I think, you know, the brilliance of what uh, Krista and Andrew and Yunsef did is recognize that that's the future of, of instruction sets. So that what we want going forward is a modular instruction set instead of the past, which has been a, you know, a uniform instruction set. So it's you know it's like uh, like when you get older, right? You gain weight as you get older. So instruction sets gain weight 
over time. And the model up until now is a monolithic instruction set. If you buy an instruction set from Intel, you, you have all 40 years of history in that instruction set. And, uh, and similarly, ARM decided when they did the VA just to start big, <laughs> really big instruction set. And now it's still growing, right? And you have, you have to implement the whole thing. You can't subset it. And I think by contract, you can't, you have to deliver everything. So that's the way people have done instruction sets since IBM in 1960. So the insight that these guys had was now that we're going to be system on a chip, it's a custom chip anyways. You get IP, you put it on with all kinds of other blocks. It, we, you, there's no need to include everything every time. So they have a base instruction set that has to be there so it can run the software stack. And then it's, it's like a, a menu, right? Do I need floating point? Check. Okay, I'll have floating point. Do I want compression instructions? No, I don't care about that. Do I care about atomics? Yep. So it's like a menu that you check, like ordering dim sum for me. <laughs> I, I, I like chashu bao and dan right? I don't, I don't have to get everything they make, right? So I just select, select from a few things, and that's what's going to the SOC. But to have that insight, you have to put, build that in from the beginning of the instruction set. So they put that in, and so it makes it possible in the SOCs to only include what you need. So the assumption is the SOC is unique to your market. So it's, it's for phones or it's for Internet of Things, and you know what it needs. And so you'll include those modules there. So there's that piece of the RISC-5 instruction set, and then uh, you might want to have your own special instructions for this application. So uh, the idea for RISC-5 is when there's consensus on what to do, there'll be a standard module that you can include. So there's consensus on floating point, there's a module for that. There's consensus on atomic. Like for deep neural networking, there's no consensus, right? Who knows, you know, we're going to be doing this for the next five or ten years, and maybe when we look back and move, right? No, we don't know. So you want to do unique things uh, per application, and that way there's opcodes set aside to do that. In the past, nobody worried about that. You'd rather have a bigger address than more opcode space. So there was no room to stick the instructions in. So basically, we've learned from mistakes of the last 30 years to have a good base. We have these modules that, uh, that you include or not, and then there's space set aside for special instructions. So it's a very different instruction set from everything that's gone on before it, and it's really hard to explain that. Right? When, when we talk about special instructions, people say, oh, it'll be like Intel, you know, it'll get bigger and bigger, and it'll be incompatible. It's, it's not like that. It's, it's a different kind of instruction set that's ever been done, and those guys uh, deserve the credit for uh, coming up with a really great idea. Finger Bob from ICT. So thank you for a great talk. So, um, so you, you mentioned that the domain specific architecture will be the future, and uh, you, we, we know that there are many uh, accelerators for machine learning and for AIs. So uh, my question is, uh, I'm wondering if, uh, if, if it is possible for those like uh, uh, machine learning accelerators and be integrated into general purpose chip, just like uh, the float point, uh, mm -hmm. just like float point uh, uh, code processors being uh, part of uh, instructions of a general purpose. So do you think it, is it possible for the future? Yes, so I think it's a, that's a great question. I think, so I think I predict Intel will do this. Intel has this instruction set that grows over time and they have, I don't know, a thousand SIMD instructions. My prediction is they'll add deep learning SIMD instructions. I, I bet they'll do that. But they also invested in a company called Nirvana, which is a, has a different instruction set architecture that's just for deep neural networking. They also spent a lot of money to buy, I guess they bought two companies. So besides expanding their instruction set, they're also making a bet in this other place. I believe for deep learning, which is one area I know a little bit about, it's just too early to standardize. The, the deep learning network itself is accelerating very fast. Uh, they're changing models all the time. So the researchers, uh, everything they try seems to work, and they're getting accuracy that's better than humans. So ignoring the hardware, that's changing very fast. And then there's lots of different ideas on how to build hardware to make deep learning run fast. And depending how, uh, where the deep learning networks end up, you'd want different hardware support for it. I think you can standardize instruction sets when there's a consensus, right? And for deep learning networks, uh, you know, this Google was one of the first, maybe the first technical 
commercial paper on a, on a deep learning accelerator for a product. I'm sure there's going to be many others with very different approaches to it. So I'm, I guess it'd take five or ten years before we would agree that this is the, the right instruction set for deep learning. So, so I don't, so my answer would be no. I don't think, or I'd say it'll take ten years before we do that. But right now, uh, if you were to standardize, uh, somebody else might have a much better idea than that. So I think it's just too soon. Hello, Professor. I want to uh, ask you some uh, questions about uh, the novel materials. Uh, for example, we get the innovation about the materials for our architectures. At the first, we um, we did my machines with the turb, and the now is the transistors. How do you think the novel techniques for manufacturers to uh, influence or affect our hardware hardware architectures? For example, the quantum computer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh so uh, I think, uh, and Chris is a better person to ask this question than I, but in terms of, it's, Moore's Law was this experiment, for 50 years it got better. So where, where uh, MOS technology has stopped, it's amazing technology. Not only is it fast and low power, and you can manufacture it. So it's, in a, it's like magic, it's an amazing technology, but it stopped. So that gives a chance for other technologies to catch up, but apparently, there's no technology that's ready, that's equally fast or reliable or manufacturable. It's going to take 10 or 20 years before carbon nanotubes or something like that will catch up. So in terms of the underlying technology, there doesn't seem to be anything that's going to compete with CMOS for a long time. Quantum computing is a very different idea. It's, it's physics as much as anything else. And in talking to people who are doing work in quantum computing, their hope within a few years is to build a quantum computer that does a toy problem that nobody cares about, but it can do it faster than any general purpose computer. So they'll do some calculation that'll work, and there's no way you can do it in a general purpose computer. Unfortunately, nobody cares. It's a problem nobody cares about, but it's to demonstrate that it can be done. If 10 years from now a quantum computer can do the same calculation that you can do on a phone, that's tremendous progress. So this is a this is a this is a science project that's out there for a while. It, it and it's capable of being kind of like a special purpose supercomputer. It could do things that you would have thought would be impossible. But for it to be kind of the standard that you do all your computing on, that's going to take a very very long uh, very long time to do. And you know there's there's a lot of excitement about quantum computing. There's people building things. So. There's indications it's going to get there, but it's it's going to be a while before it can be used for lots of things. So let me uh, wrap it up there. Thanks very much, Dave. Okay. That was awesome.